to bring Mike Cunningham here from Norwood. Wealth of experience, a veteran of the Vietnam War, author of five books at this point, and the stories he's sharing with us tonight are from his career in U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Uh, so, Mike Cunningham, thank you for being here all the way from Norwood. Take it away. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, I don't think you'll have any trouble hearing me. Uh, just to, uh, what I'm going to show you tonight is uh, about my career in United States Customs. I spent almost 30 years uh, in Customs, uh, and I was, the, um, uh, I was a Customs Inspector. I mostly worked on the drug team and then the counterterrorism team. And uh, so I'll, I'll just show you the pictures. They say a picture's worth a thousand words, so I'll just show you pictures and uh, tell stories about them. And any questions, just, just interrupt me and ask, okay? Uh, right here, this is uh, Conley Terminal in South Boston. This is where these are all sea containers, you know, the 40-foot, 20-foot sea containers you see. Uh, th and this is, this right here is the x-ray truck that we use. And see the arm right here? And, and here's the truck. This, x th th this is the, the container with the cab pulling it. But this x-ray truck, it, it only takes like 30 seconds. It'll run down the whole length of the truck, and it's just a regular x-ray. You can see all inside of it uh, and, and see if what's, what they say is in it is in it. Uh, so, and uh, it also has a radiation detector on the side of it. So we're doing two things at once, you know. Uh, and this is obviously, in, this is in response to 9-11, you know. In the old days, we used to actually climb into the containers, inspect them and everything, but now we don't have to do as much because we can just uh, use in this high tech and it's, it's getting more uh, sophisticated every day. Um, we try to do, you know, uh, obviously we can't do x-ray all the containers. We, uh, we will x-ray all the high risk containers and then as many other containers as possible. So, Mike, how long does it take for that arm to go over the... To, uh, less than a minute. Okay. We'll, 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 we'll run the length of the container and inspect it in, in 60 seconds for sure. Is that trailer truck ready to drive away? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Have you folks ever heard of the Rams Land and the Valhalla? No? Okay. Let's just see that. Uh, you know about the IRA in Ireland, Irish Republican Army, and all this stuff? Okay, well, this, this boat right here, the Valhalla, okay, some bad guys, you've heard of Whitey Bulger, okay, the, the, some bad guys, you know, with the Irish connection. They fill this boat up, Valhalla, they fill it up with machine guns, uh, explosives, ammunition, uh, uh, flak jackets, you know, the, and everything. And, and what they were doing, they were moving, they were going to take this boat, the Valhalla, and transport it to Ireland for the uh, IRA, Irish Republican Army. Okay? Uh, well, uh, we, we knew something about it uh, ahead of time, and we actually unbeknownst to these guys, obviously. We were tracking the Valhalla, the route, across the North Atlantic by way of satellite. Okay, so, so we were watching where she was going. And what happened when the Valhalla was off the west coast of Ireland, they transferred all these weapons and everything to an Irish boat that went into Ireland, and the Valhalla came back to Boston empty. And we seized her in, in PS7 in South Boston, the, the, the Valhalla, okay? Um, but part of the, there wasn't any money exchanged or anything, but, but what was exchanged, uh, sorry, this, this 
for all these weapons going island and everything, this ship called the Ramsland, a tram steamer, came into Boston with 34 tons of marijuana. It was a quid pro quo thing, you know? So the weapons and everything went to Ireland and the payment for all that. And that boat, the Valhalla, left out of Gloucester, okay? But this ship, the Ramsland, came, came into Boston Harbor with 34 tons of marijuana, okay? But she, when we boarded her, okay, all it was was just crushed stone. Uh, there were like two holes on this, on this boat. I'll show you some more pictures. There were two holes. And when we jumped on board and took off the hatch covers, they were just, just they, it was crushed stone. So we're saying, geez, what's going on here? And said, well, we put, a, we put a drug dog on board, and the drug dog alerted to the crushed stone. You know? So we dug down, and we found this old piece of plastic with all grease on it and everything. And they, they had used this piece of plastic, you know, that the odor was there. So what happened for the next two days, uh, the next two days, we, we used a steam, old-fashioned steam shovel and just emptied out these two holes, okay? And still, there, there wasn't any, and the holes were bigger than this room, okay? And, and they're much bigger than this room. And, and, and we still didn't have any marijuana. Well, what, what, and I'll show you what happened. See, there's another picture of the Rams there. Once we, see, see all this is, this is the crushed stone I was telling you about? Once we got down to the bottom of the, of the hole, okay, still there was nothing. Well, we, we knew uh, that there was, uh, we got out the blueprints, and we knew like right here in the deck there, there was supposed to be a manhole cover, because not to get too technical, but uh, there's like a call it double bottoms. There's a, like a V shape on the hull of the boat. Okay, and so we're standing, we're standing on the bottom here. We know there's like six more foot down here to the keel, but we could, couldn't figure out how to get there. And we, we knew there was supposed, supposed to be a manhole cover here, but it was all just cement. So we took a sledgehammer and just busted open the cement, and lo and behold, there was the manhole cover we're looking for. Okay, so... Uh, Once we lifted up the manhole cover, okay, there, see, those are the bales of marijuana, okay? This is all the crushed stone I was telling you about, but there's the marijuana. There was, there was 34 tons of marijuana there. I have a couple of questions. First of all, when did this happen? And secondly, did you know this was connected to the marijuana? Yeah, we, we knew something. We, How did you know that? We, had a, we had someone working for us. Uh, it's a confidential informant. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, but you know, confidence, it's CIs they're called. They're, they're, you gotta be careful of them because sometimes they're, they're working both sides, you know, and you don't know what's going on, you know, so you gotta be awful careful. But, but uh, that's, yeah, and we boarded the Ramsland when it was still at, out at sea. We found it off the coast of Massachusetts and we brought it into Boston. Okay, but those, that's the marijuana, 34 tons of marijuana, okay? Uh, people were killed over this, you know? Pe people actually died. Uh, uh, the sad part about it, one guy was, was killed. This, I, again, this is the Whitey Bulger gang, you know? A guy was killed because they thought he was a snitch, but he, well, he wasn't a snitch, there was someone else, you know? So it, it's... But, uh, you know, I, I won't go into the, all the little details, but it was, it was th this was an interest. See, there's, there's some of the marijuana right there. You know, this, this is on the, on the um, Coast Guard dock in Boston. Did you say that the marijuana was brought to the Ramsland by the Coast Guard? See, there's some more. But that's the rams there. So it was the Valhalla going over the, the rams there and coming, coming by. Ironic thing about it, there were five crew members on the rams land, and uh, they were all British sailors. And, and believe it or not, they were all uh, found innocent and just kicked out of the country. 
because we couldn't prove that they had. They said that they picked up the ship when it was already loaded, so they didn't know what was on board. So that's that's the way the justice system works. Uh, but yeah, that's the story of the Ramsler and the Valhalla. There's a lot of. There's been a few good books written about this. Uh, See, there's, there's the manhole cover before we pulled it. Questions? The room? Uh, when did this happen? I'm sorry. Oh, this uh, uh, 15 years ago. It, it was a while back. Uh, this, is another, uh, this is another story about this ship here. Uh, uh, well, here, well, let me talk about this. We, we got a call once about, there's a guy in Chinatown, okay, uh, went to this mailbox, picked up his mail, okay, and he opened up his mail and he's, he had a bill of lading in front of him, you know, about a bean sprout washing machine, okay. So he's looking, a bill of lading is a shipping document, okay, and he's looking and he says, I didn't know what any, you know, beans for a washing machine coming from China, okay? As he was looking at this perplexed, there was a knock on the door and it was some of the local wise guys from Chinatown. And they told him, go take the paperwork, go into customs and clear it in customs f for them. And the reason why they were doing it, this guy would, would has like a clean record and everything. So us doing some background check on him he would be able to get this thing through where these bad guys wouldn't. So anyhow, this guy, and this guy had been flirted with, you know, flirted with the law before also. So this guy that with a bill of lading was thinking about what to do. He called his lawyer. His lawyer said, you better, you better go do what they tell you to do, otherwise they'll kill him. They'll kill you, you know? So I said, okay. But then the lawyer starts thinking about it. Now the lawyer realizes he's involved in this, you know? So he said, oh, geez, wait a minute. So the lawyer luckily called over the airport, luckily talked to, uh, talked to a trooper that we worked with all the time. The trooper wasn't sure what was going on, but he got a hold of us. We, we, went, we made an arrangement to meet this guy up on the North Shore, and we interviewed him, and we found out what was going on. That, this, this bean sprout wash machine, you know, was highly suspect of something going on with it. It was, it was coming from China. So this is us at a warehouse in Chelsea. This is me right here with the hammer. You know, we had lifted the top off and there's the machine. It's a, it's a machine, it, you know, it's, and it's got, it's got five rollers. See, that's like a roller on end, that's a roller. Here's another one, and that's me tapping the, ro the roller with a hammer. And obviously the roller should be, should be, uh, no, should be hollow, hollow, right? So you sh it should echo, okay? Well, I, I, every time I, uh, I tap, you know, it's just a big thud. So I said, mm, something's going on. So what we did, what we did is, uh, See, the, the, here's the roller here, and here's our drill. Uh, we drilled into the roller, and puff, there's, see all that white stuff? It was tested for almost pure heroin, okay? Uh, there, there's another picture of the machine. Uh, see, there's two, two of the rollers on the ground. But there were five rollers. See, he, we took, we took, now we know the rollers, there's something in the rollers. We took the rollers to a machine shop. And, and it's funny how it works. Everyone thinks like customs, that you know, the federal agency, we always know what we're doing. It's half the time we're like the Keystone cops, you know. And, and we took these five rollers down to a machine shop that one of our buddies' father owned, you know. And, and he, he put them on a, on a lathe, it, oops, mm, uh, and see, cut off the end. And, and see, these are all packets of heroin, okay? These are all packets of heroin. We had, 
I think it was 183 pounds of almost pure heroin. Okay, it's a pretty big seizure. Uh, and yeah, it's a, it, it was a, what happened, I'll, I'll, I'll make a long story short. Um, we took all that heroin, 183 pounds. Well, we took 182 pounds in our custody. We put one pound of heroin back in the rollers with 182 pounds of sand. For, the, for legal purposes, it has to be the equal weight. If we put it all back together, we, put it, we, we nailed the box back, we put it back on the floor of the, of the warehouse. We wanted to get the guys to when they picked it up. Well, they, pick, they came in the next day to pick it up and they drove into Chinatown in a rental truck, okay? And when they went into Chinatown, they, you know, and we're following them from, from all angles and everything. And, and they parked the car, the truck, on the, by the sidewalk, got out and walked away. So now we're trying to say, okay, how can we maintain surveillance on this vehicle, on this truck, you know, in, in Chinatown, all Chinese people, and, and all, we are just a bunch of Anglos, you know? So luckily, we had a van with a telescopic lens on the top of it, where we were able to squeeze it into a, a, um, a gas station. And we sat there and, and kept an eye on the, on the, on the truck through the, using a telescopic lens. And they, they kept it there all day. The next day, the guys came back, jumped in the truck, and, and we said, okay, here we go again. And so then they took off. Well, they went around the corner, pulled it up to the sidewalk, parked it, and jumped out again. Oh, you, know, you know what they were doing, right? Shaking the tail. Yeah, they, they, they were trying to, this was kind of surveillance. So they were seeing if someone was watching, you know, and they were, they were trying to expose us. And, and, and it's super hard, you, you, you know. And so, so sure enough, that's what they did, and we had to wait another whole day. Finally, they got in the vehicle again the third day, and then they just start driving around the block, driving around the block, driving around the block. You know what they were doing this time? They had a spotter on each corner of the block to see if a car was following the truck. You know, so, so we kept, you know, we had like 10 vehicles there, so we had to keep, someone had to get on them and, and tail them and then break off and a new car, get, you know, they couldn't be the same car because they'd say, no, this, you've got a tail on you, you know? So anyhow, again, to bring this story to conclusion, um, we, we, follow this, we follow this van and we, we finally made a whole bunch of arrests in South Boston. Uh, and it was an apartment uh, building uh, by Andrews Square where uh, we, we raided the house, the apartment building. And uh, it's funny, when it happened, there was a Boston policeman, and we, we had, because this is a kind of a serious case, we had units from all over the area just, just moved in at once, and we actually even had a chopper, a helicopter, that came in right on top of the building at the same time. And while this was all going on, there's a Boston police officer on a construction detail out in front of the building, <laughs> you know, just, just, and he sees everyone running by him with shotguns and machine guns and everything, and like, he's like, you know, like, you know, you know what's, like, what's this, a movie or something, you know, and I felt bad for, for him because he had no idea what's going on. It, you know, it's, uh, but it's, uh, you know, we, we made a whole bunch of arrests on this, and they were all successfully uh, convicted, and, Sent to so jail. When you're doing surveillance like that in van, how many people are on a team? Not just uh, watching right there, but you know who, who you're communicating with. And are we talking about dozens of people? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, some, sometimes it can be a hundred. Yeah, and it's not just United States Customs. It's state police. It's DEA. It's local police. It's got to be a joint. It's it's a, like a task force. It's uh, it's not just you know, yeah, uh, you, you need resources from all over the place. Uh, but, but we worked with each other all the time and everything. I'm retired now, so I'm not, I don't do this anymore. <laughs> you know, I'm too old to do this. But, but it's, uh, yeah, you, you need a lot of resources. Uh, questions on this one? This, anyone recognize what that is? 
No, it's called ecstasy. Okay. We got a call a couple of days. This is again a few years back. We got a call a couple of days before Christmas that a ship was coming into Searsport, Maine. Okay, and a couple of people on board the ship had we had had contact with them in the past. You know, we we were suspicious of these individuals. So, so Bangor, Maine, called down to me in Boston and asked if I could bring the drug team up to Bangor and introduce ourselves to these guys. So we, so, you know, I said, yeah, sure, two days before Christmas, I, we, we just, you know, were so excited to go, you know, all the way up to Maine, you know, and, but we had them, and we did. And, and but we, we went up from Boston, we picked up people in Portsmouth and we picked up people in Portland and and then we all met up in Searsport, Maine, and in this ship here, uh, you know, we we waited. The ship was delayed, so finally, uh, the, the the ship was delayed because of weather, and and you know it was like typical Maine winter night. It was it was slow, snowing and sleeting and everything. So everything was ice, and but as soon as the ship pulled up, pulled in, and secured. Uh, we jumped on board, and what we do when we jump aboard a ship, we, we know how many crew members are on board, and there was like 35 crew members here. So we jumped on board, and we corral all the crew on the mess deck immediately, you know, just to, and then we do a head count to make sure, okay, we have all the crew in front of us. So we put a guide on, on to make sure the crew stays where they are. Then we sweep the vessel to make sure there aren't any other people on board. If there are any more people, you know they're not good people, you know. So once we once we uh, once we maintain that, okay, the ship is secured, safe. Then we go searching. I took I put two of my best guys uh, on this one cabin. Told them to search this one guy's cabin. He's the one of the guys that we were suspicious of. Says, go right to his cabin, search his cabin. Okay, so and I, everyone, I, I had everyone had pre-designated uh, responsibilities where to go. So as I'm walking around the ship, making sure everything's go, going okay, I get a call from these two guys from this cabin saying they want to see me. So I know something's going on. Okay, so uh, this this is the one this is the one gentleman who would call me on the radio. Uh, what happened? What happened is that uh, when he was searching the room, see, this is, this is the bulkhead of, of the cabin. This is his bunk. This is the headboard. And right along the side here, uh, on, along the deck, there's like a sock drawer, okay? Well, he pulled out the sock drawer, and he pulled it right out, and then he looked underneath, underneath the bed. And initially, he didn't see anything. But then he said to himself, because I'm always saying, you know, you just don't poke your head in, you know, look, you know, you gotta get in there and look. So he turned on his flashlight and he stuck his head up in, underneath the bunk. And he said in the corner, he saw a bag just hanging there, looked like a bag of aspens. And we knew what we were looking for. We were looking for ecstasy. So that's when he called for me on the radio. And we came down, I came down and what we did, see, the, the, see this board right here? This was the top of the headboard, okay? So we ripped that off, and that's what we saw, okay? There, there were, see right here, there were 10 pounds, I mean 10 bags of, uh, ten, each bag had 10,000 uh, ecstasy pills, so it was 100,000 ecstasy pills, okay? Uh, this is, this is, even to this day, this is the largest ecstasy seizure in the state of Maine. It was worth like between five and eight million dollars. Okay. Uh, we have the seizure, everything's fine. We know where the guy is. He's up on the mess deck. Okay. Now we have to go arrest him. Now, we're saying, who's going to arrest him? I said, well, you made the seizure, you arrest him. 
He says, well, you've been around longest, you arrest them. And then they ganged up on me and said, well, you're the boss, you arrest them. And I thought, oh, geez, because we know this guy, this guy's a big guy. This guy was a, he was a Croatian guy. He was a big guy. He, he had thighs of, the size of tree trunks. He was a big guy. So he said, we know when we go up to the deck to arrest them, we know we're going to be bouncing off the bulkhead, you know, to, to try to get him in handcuffs. So, so I said, well, you know, just be assertive. So I went up there and I just, he was sitting there and I approached him. I said, get on your feet. He got up on his feet and I said, stick your arms out. He put his arms out and we put handcuffs on him. He said, this, <laughs> you know, wow, this is easy, you know? And, but just to tell you the human side of the story here too. Um, uh, as we are leaving, he's in handcuffs. As we're leaving, one of the guys going down the ladder to, to go to the main deck to get off the ship, he fell, okay, and he fell hard, okay? And this guy, he's in handcuffs. He slid down the ladder and helped the inspector up off the, you know, he, he's on his way to jail, okay? But, it, you know, he's still, you know, and I tell that story because we always treated people properly. You know, we never, we never gave a cheap shot or anything. We always, you know, they're under arrest and we're not gonna put up with any malarkey from them, but we also treat them civilly, you know, and we always did. And, and just like this guy, this guy went to jail for seven years. And it was kind of sad because he was a really, sounds stupid, but he was a nice guy, <laughs> you, you, know, you know what I'm saying? But he did wrong and he was gonna suffer the consequences. Uh, Okay, cot. Anyone know what cot is? What are you saying, cot? Cot, K-H-A-T. They chew it to get intoxicated. Yeah, it's, it's like, uh, how do you know that? <laughs> to, <laughs> stay, after, stay after class, I want to talk to you. <laughs> uh, cot is, like you said, it's a hallucinogen. It's like um, psilocybin, you know, LSD, okay? But it's, it's indigenous to East Africa, okay? And what, it's, it's a natural plant, okay? But they chew it, and it gives them, you know, uh, it's a, a, a hallucinogen. Uh, okay, um, anyone watch, ever see that movie, Captain Phillips? You know, about that ship that was captured? And we... we oh. Hijacking me right. in Somalia. Yeah, yeah, Somalia. yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember in the lifeboat, the guy that kept chewing something, but then when he started, when he was, he was yelling, he wanted some more of that stuff, and they didn't have it, and that's when he started to go cuckoo. That's what he was chewing on. Cot. Okay. Now, cot comes through Logan Airport. Unbelievable. And it's going up to Lewiston, Maine, Portland, Maine. Why those two places? have a big population, Somalians, up in Lewiston, Maine, in Portland, Maine. So a lot of it is going up there, okay? But, and, and, but, but what's so, you know, people say, well, well cot, uh, you know, it's not like heroin or something. But we, we, we have documented proof that the proceeds from this cot fund terrorist activities, okay? And it's, it's valuable stuff. Uh, uh, see, here's another picture. Tell you a quick real story about this. Uh, one day, um, agriculture, they were just x-raying bags left and right. Well, uh, agriculture girl, as she put this bag through the x-ray, she recognized it. She said, knew it was cot. So she called me and it came over and uh, we opened back sure enough car so we know that guys there's always the, how they do it there's two two guys and they're both they're from england okay and and y you can tell just you know they're they're they're, they're rough looking guys and everything so so t if you want to how we target them so anyhow i asked the guy i says okay where's your partner and he said i'm not with anyone and, you know, I know he is with some. So we gave him a little bit of, bit of attitude adjustment. And then he admitted, yeah, he was with someone else, but he already got out. He was out in the lobby of the Terminal E at Logan. We went out, 
We looked for him, he wasn't there. So I came back and I says, where were you going? And he told me the hotel he was supposed to go to. So I called the hotel and I said, do you have reservations for these two people? And she says, not only do I have reservations, one of them just checked in. So we jumped in the car, we bolted over to the hotel, found the room he was at, banged on the door, the guy opened up the door and he's standing there with his two bags. He said, I was waiting for you. You know, and he just walked away, you know, with it. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, but it's. Uh, Does it always look like this? Or this is like Christmas decoration. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll see that, that that's, that's a wrapping right there. That's like a leaf wrapping. But that's the cot right there. Yeah, yeah. The, the, that's the cot right there. But that, that's a wrapping, you know, with string on it. Okay, see, but that, and all they do is chew it. it and the thing is, they're, they're, they're under the gun because uh, it loses its potency if it starts drying up. So it's got to be shipped quick. So they're, they're under pressure to move it, you know. Uh, but this, 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 this is an ongoing problem, the card. What is that? Yeah, it's, it's an LNG, liquefied natural gas. Okay, that's, you know, it's, it might not be of as, as much concern out here, but in Boston, there's a big, con that, that's a floating bomb, okay? And, and uh, it's liquefied natural gas. Uh, that's the ship coming into Boston Harbor. But, and it's, it's this ship is called Mustafa Ben Boulad. Uh, it's coming from Algeria, and and it's it's you know back then we couldn't we wouldn't even talk about it even amongst ourselves. But this is how a lot of the terrorists came into the country on these ships. Okay, uh, and, and 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 what would happen? The ship would come in port right from Algeria. It'd have 30 crew members on board, okay? Everything's fine. But when the ship sails, there's only 25 crew members on board. So five jump ship. Now, what's supposed to happen? When the five, if, if the ship is ready to sail and the crew, all the crew's not there, the captain is supposed to not sail, call customs, we go on board and we start an investigation. This time, you know, on these LNGs, the captain would not, would just sail knowing he was missing five guys. If he followed the, with the law and everything, he would be thrown overboard halfway back to Algeria, the captain. You know what I'm saying? So, but, but this, is, this was an ongoing problem. And, and so why I'm telling this story, one day we boarded this ship when she was still about 50 miles out at sea. Uh, we boarded with the Coast Guard, the State Police, Customs, who else, DEA, a whole bunch of different agencies. We boarded it and, and we searched and everything. We found a little bit of hash and everything. We actually brought divers with us and the divers actually dove on the hull of the ship to make sure there wasn't anything attached to the hull of the vessel. So, but what, what we did, I had one of my guys copy the passports, the biogra biographical page of each passport, okay? And, and, uh, so, and we had 40, when we were done, we had 40 pieces of paper with the bi uh, biographical information of each crew member. And the reason why I was doing that, uh, uh, what we did a couple of hours before this ship sailed, we reboarded the ship. And I was going to make sure, I was going to do a physical check, make sure those 40 crew members that came in were sailing, okay? I never even got the chance to do that because when I, when I was boarding the ship, okay, there's a security at the gangway, okay? And I checked the logbook. There's a security. Every time someone goes on, off the ship or on the ship, they log them. Okay, so I just looked at the log that the security kept. And everyone goes aboard, or goes ashore once or twice, you know, to go shopping, or there's a bar down the street called King Phillips, you know, and, 
everyone goes on board, you know, goes ashore, you know, once, twice for two, three hours, and they go back aboard the ship and that's it. But there was this one guy, assistant cook, he went ashore four times. And he went aboard, when he went ashore, like, and the, not only was the four times inordinate, he went on board in the middle of the night and only for short periods of time. Like, he went ashore like at uh, 0015 hours, you know, 15 minutes after 12, went back on board at 25 minutes after 12, went ashore again, you know, like at 1 o'clock, went back on board at 110. Four trips, okay? And I'm saying to myself, this guy was on a mission. This guy was going ashore, bringing something ashore, going back. So, so I told two guys, or I told the captain, I said, bring this guy up here. I want to talk to this guy, the assistant cook. And the captain told me he didn't have enough time. They were, the tugs were alongside. They were ready to sail. And I said, Captain, you ain't going nowhere until we tell you to go. So the quicker you comply with us, you know. So, so Captain brought the assistant cook up. The assistant cook could only speak French. So I had to use the captain as the interpreter. But, you know, I could just tell, like, the guy, the sweat was just pouring off of his forehead, his carotid was pumping out of his, his mouth was dry, you know. So, so, let's go look at his cabin. Well, I sent two guys down to look at his cabin. As they were looking at the cabin, something that we don't normally do, but I told him, bring the guy with you, just to expedite this, okay? Because I was trying, I didn't want to hold up the ship too long if it wasn't necessary. So. The two guys, my two inspectors, went down to search this guy's cabin, the assistant cook's cabin, told the assistant cook to stay out on the passageway. So one of my guys was on his hands and knees going through his, his personal possessions, his locker, and he, then he saw some plastic, you know, a rectangular-shaped object wrapped in plastic. So he pulled it out. At that time, he felt some, you know, the guy jumped, bolted off the, out of the passageway and jumped on his back. Problem is, this inspector was, he used to play football for Northeastern. He was the star in the center. He, he was a bull. Well, he just took the guy and flipped him off his back and smashed him into the bulkhead. You know, what it was, he had four, he still had four pounds of hash on board and he had $8,000 in cash in his pocket. Okay, so needless to say, he got arrested, the ship didn't sail, okay? And, and now, now this, was, this was in like July of 2001, okay? You gotta put, put this in perspective. This was July of 2001. We, we, got the, we arrested this guy for, you know, four pounds, at the minimum, four pounds of hash, okay? Well, we had to go to court, obviously. And the judge said that the guy's mother was dying in Algeria and he wanted his passport just to go home for a couple of weeks and then he'd come back and face the charges. And we said, Judge, this, this, this is nonsense. You let this guy leave the country, he, he, you're never going to see him, you know? And, and this was like the latter part of August. And this went on back and forth for a few days. Finally, the judge ordered us, give him his passport. He's going for two, two, uh, and we're saying, what, what's, the, what's the, like the, the pressure on us was intense. And what's, why is there so much going on here? He's like got all sorts of lawyers. And why is he, okay, even if his mother is dying, something's inordinate, inordinate here. You know, some, so this is the last part of August, okay? What happened, and, and he finally did, we gave him his passport and he got out of the country. What happened? September 11, he knew this was happening. This guy, this assistant cook, he knew if, if he didn't get out of the country before it happened, he'd never get out of the country. You know, he, he was, he was, he had be thrown in jail and the, the key would have been deep sixed, you know? So, you know, and, and of course he never did come back. Uh, but that's just one story about this LNG, the liquefied natural gas. See, that's, that's her leaving. This, this is called Bami. Um, uh, Bami is native to its bread coming from Jamaica, okay? It's just, just little loaves of bread, okay? And it's, a, you know, they're 
people that go down to Jamaica, visit their relatives, and come home with Bami. Absolutely no problem at all. But they got slick, and, and what they started to do, see, here's, this is legitimate Bami up here, okay? But what they started to do, they take marijuana, and they press it real, real, you know, in, in, a, in the shape, their circular shape, and then they put glue all over it and spread wheat germ and everything on it, so it looks exactly like Bami but it's marijuana, okay? But unbeknownst to them, what we do, when the Jamaica flight comes in, we go outside on the ramp, and as the bags are coming down, we open up the bags, and we see Bami. We have little probes, and we probe the Bami, and if your probe doesn't go right through the Bami, you know, we know it's marijuana, okay? What we do, we close the bags back up, and we put them on the carousel, and we let them go inside, okay? The reason why we do this, we know, we, we have the bags ID. So the bags are inside now, so we wait for the people to claim the bags, we let them leave, leave the customs area. We're, we have people undercover in mass port uniforms, like, you know, just sweeping the floor, emptying the buckets and everything outside, you know, and even on the curb. So those people go out with their bags of marijuana, okay? Now they're all laughing and everything because they got away, okay? And they meet people, okay? Now they're all laughing, slapping. They'll even go to the bar and have a drink together, you know? And, okay, have your fun. You know, we're just sweeping around, you know, and everything. But then they go out and go across the street to, you know, pop the trunk, throw the bags in, then we snap them all, okay? You know, we come, we blitz them, okay? And the reason why we do that, we want more bodies, plus we seize the car. We, the, that car actually becomes government property. But they, they forfeit it. So we get, we get more bodies, more arrests in, you know, a car. Plus, it's nice satisfaction, you know, you know, knowing that, you know, they, they think they got away, you know. Uh, but that's bombing. Right after 9-11, uh, you can see, see that? End of 95. So where, where are we? Where's end of 95? Maine. Holt in Maine. Uh, this is us. Oh, yeah. We, we, we knew, you know, after 9-11, we shut down all the airports and everything. And we knew there were still bad guys here that were trying to get out of Dodge. So we, we, we in, in this area, we went right up to the New England border, you know, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and we just sealed off the border. The, the, no, and this is us doing outbounds. This, this is a van trying to leave the country. So we stop them, and we, we ID everyone, make sure that none of them are bad guys before we let them go. So see, this, this is, see that, that says customs, set customs, set CET means contraband enforcement team. But that, this is us, and believe me, there's other people on the other side. And this, the, and this is our vehicle here also, okay? Uh, so a lot of the stuff we do that no one even knows we're doing, you know. This is one of the helicopters we used on the northern border, you know. Uh, this is actually a Vermont National Guard, but just what I, just what I said, that, that um, uh, we don't, you know, customs, we have to use everyone. So in this case, we're using the Vermont National Guard. This is their chopper and to just to patrol the, what we call the slash. See, this is the slash. This is Canada. This is the United States. This is my big fingers. This is what you call the slash right here, the, the uh, DMZ, the no man zone, okay? And what we do, we actually walk this. Like we'll go from one border station to the next border station, which is only maybe three miles down the road, but I tell you what, it takes you all day to get there because you're going up hill, down, hill, down. You know what I'm saying? And it, it's crazy, you know? And, and uh, this here is a, this is a, sh this is just some of the pictures I've, t I've taken in the sea. This is a ship that's actually right here. This ship is a ground. 
See, can you make out the island here? Right here, the dock, it's a little darker. And see how she's listing the ship? She's actually aground. This is a tug trying to pull her off, okay? Uh, this is us, and this is just a picture. And, and this picture doesn't do it justice, but we're trying to get aboard this ship out at sea, okay? See all this water here? See the waves are crashing on the well deck there and just pouring off of there. We're trying to get in there to get on the ship, okay? But, and you can see the seas here. You know, I mean, it was, it's horrendous. I mean, the, the picture doesn't do it justice. You know, you, it, it, it looks bumpy here, but when you're out there, it's really bumpy, you know? That's the pilot boat there. There's a ship coming into Boston Harbor right there. Uh, this is, I'll tell you a quick story here. This, this, uh, this was not shaky grounds, but you had to know the law to do this. This is a kilo of cocaine, okay? We got a call from, from an airline saying that, that uh, one of their customers going from Boston to Detroit, something was wrong, something was wrong. And they asked us if we could come, come down. And said, okay, we'll meet you in the back, you know, in the baggage room. So when we got there, they had already opened up this bag, they opened it up. We didn't tell them to open it. They opened it up and there was a kilo of Coke sitting right there in front of us, okay? So, see, because you gotta be careful. This is domestic and we're customs. We, you know, we have board search authority, but if we do a domestic search, you need a search warrant. But we didn't search this. The, the, they did a safety check on the bag. So it's something, you know, you gotta be awful careful. You gotta know the law. Anyhow, I asked the airline people, where is this guy? And they said, he's already on the plane. I said, where's the plane? The plane's on the taxiway going to the runway. So I said, can you bring the plane back? And they said, wow, you know what you, and I said, we need the plane, you know? So they brought the plane back. They brought the plane back to the gate. We jumped on board and we grabbed this guy and, and make a long story short, uh, this guy was an Irish guy. Okay, big brogue on him. Um, going in, and uh, you know, it, the, uh, the assistant U.S. attorney didn't want to go with it. It was, it was too, too, you know, they were, she was overloaded and everything. We understand, you know. <laughs> so the guy got off. I mean, we, we didn't even arrest him. We just said, okay, see you later, your history. He, and he wanted this stuff back. He said, what, what are you, crazy? He, he, he said, well, you've got to give me a note saying that you took it, you know, because he, all he was was a mule, okay? And we said, we're not, well, I won't be as graphic as what we told him, but we said, no, nah, you, you just see you later, okay? We often wonder what happened to this guy because he's going to go back now to the bad guys. They're going to say, wait a minute, they got you with a kilo of Coke, okay, and they just let you go? And you want us to believe that? And you, can, you know, so e either he's working for the feds now, either that or he stole it, you know? So what, what was this guy's fate, you know? You know? Um, but that's, yeah. This, this is a bag of, full of marijuana, uh, again, from Jamaica, okay? This is just, just the, you know, all the marijuana. It's in false size. What they do, they just, they, they, take, they take a regular, suitcase, open it up, they, they'll, they'll put a plastic samsonite, they'll, they'll mold the marijuana, then they insert a piece of plastic in there and they glue it, okay? But you can tell, it's called a scratch field test. If you scratch one side, scratch it, do it in your suitcase at home, scratch it and put your hand on the other side, you'll feel the scratch. If it's got a, excuse me, if it's a false side, you can't feel it. And uh, there's other ways to, to but, this is a Coast Guard. Like I said, we see this is us. Um, this is a Coast Guard 41 footer. This is a Coast Guard boat. Uh, uh, we would do we, what we'll do like offshore, we'll do a blitz. We'll just take 100 miles of shore, like 20 miles out to sea, and we'll board everything that floats. You know, the Coast Guard, we'll have overflights and everything, just be blitzing the whole area. 
you know, and we, we try to have it intelligence driven that would like we had some kind of information why we're doing this. Uh, it depends again, uh, 12 miles for sure, but it can go further. If, if there's a hovering vessel out there that you can't, can't identify, uh, um, you know, there's, there's, there's exceptions. But each, each case is different. But, but definitely, you know, say from uh, three miles, three miles out, okay, three miles to shore is inland waters. But three miles, that's the international line. But then there's a custom zone there, okay? So. Uh, well, I think three miles is a state border. Right. And 12 is federal. Right. And now the fishing, they're trying to get 200. Well, we have that. That's a, that's a, that's an economic zone. That we, we have that, but it's still, it doesn't mean we have customs authority. It's, it's all, every, every case, you have to build it up. You know, the, the, this is, so if you remember I told you the 183 pounds of pure heroin, this is with the globe said a billion dollars. It, it really wasn't a billion, but it was worth, worth a lot. It was worth many millions. This is divers. Remember I told you that we use divers. Here's divers. And why we use divers, uh, they're looking for what they, we call a parasitical device. What they'll do uh, on, on ships, you know, the ships will just have like a curved hull, but then they have fins that come out. They're called stabilizers, okay? To, just to prevent the ship from rocking excessively. So these stabilize it. What they'll do, when this ship is like down Columbia, loading up for oil for the States, okay, divers will go into the water and uh, they'll have like a 10 foot section of PVC full of cocaine and they cap both ends and they attach it to the, the bilge keel on the ship. Okay, unbeknownst to the crew, the crew has no knowledge of it at all, okay? And so the ship comes all the way up here, okay? Comes up to Chelsea Creek, you know, here in Boston, and then tie up, they'll, we'll go on board, we'll search the ship, we'll interview the crew, everyone's clean. Unbeknownst to us, there's divers on the hull, okay? Taking that 10-foot section of PVC full of cocaine, okay? So you got, there's a, uh, so we dive on as many ships as we can. And if they, if they can do it with, cocaine, they can do it with an explosive too, you know. Okay, I'll, I'll end here just by, you know what this is right here? Condoms of, of heroin. You know what swallowers, ever hear of swallowers? Swallowers and packers. Yeah, there's a great movie, Mary, something, about that experience. Swallowers, uh, they'll actually, I think, uh, I think Boston, I think our record was 147 eggs, pellets, uh, balloons, whatever you want to call them. But they, what they do, they take heroin and they pack it real tight. They take, put saran wrap, wrap it in saran wrap. They put it in a balloon, little kid's balloon, and they tie off the end with dental floss, okay? They have a big bowl of these eggs, okay? They take medicine, like antacid medicine, okay? And then, then what they'll do, uh, uh, they have this concoction that they take and while they're popping these eggs, okay? And the eggs are full of heroin, so they have a tummy full of heroin when they get here, like to Boston, okay? This, this is a real tough one because, you know, I think you're a swallower, and I'm gonna, the only way I can know, I gotta take you to the hospital to, to have an x-ray. But if I'm wrong, you know, I just deny you of your civil liberties. Now I'm opening myself for a lawsuit, you know? And a lot of times they'll purposely set us up, you know, giving us all the indication they're a swallower, but they're, they're not, you know? But now we're going for a lawsuit, so they're going for the money. You know, so it's tough. It's like, plus, you to, plus, even if this guy is loaded, we have to stay with him until he's clean you know we we bring him to the hospital they x-ray him you can see it all you can see it in the x-ray so we have to bring him to the emergency room now he's in the medical care but he's in, still in our custody they give him that go lightly stuff 
you know, when you have a colonoscopy there, you know, uh, yeah, and and we stay there, and you know, it's it's not the most pleasant thing in the world. You know, a lot of these guys have a HIV and stuff. You know, so you know, you know, it's uh, but it's unpleasant at best. Uh, so it's it, it's a it's a but what happened? I'll end with this story. We had this one day. We had two guys we were suspicious of. Brought them to the hospital. They were both loaded. Okay, beautiful. Okay. The doctors give them a go lightly. They're passing at them, boom, 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 boom. And, and then we get word, one of these guys, one of, the, one of the balloons is blocked and it's leaking, okay? He's got to have emergency surgery. This hospital we were in couldn't do it. So we had to bring in the Mass General. So here we are, you know, three o'clock in the morning, we're rushing through the streets of Boston, trying to get this guy to Mass General before he dies, you know, this guy's bringing all this stuff into the country. Now we're, for, you know, we got guys at one hospital, you know, and, and you know, this is the middle of the night. We, our resources are dwindling, you know. So we, we've got to worry about the safety of our guys at that one hospital. We're trying to get over to this other hospital to save this guy life. You know, some people just, you know, uh, it, it was, it's, it's, it's a tough thing to do. Uh, but, uh, uh, See that those those blue things. That's so those are the, those are the eggs. Did yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. It it ended up successful, but no. no. Uh, but um, even what's worse than than uh, if there's anything worse than swallow us a packers, and I'll tell you why, uh, and then I am going to end. Packers, where they can put in a body cavity, vaginally or rectally, okay, and we've had it, you know, they'll take, they'll take like four ounces of heroin and they'll insert it in a body cavity, four ounces of heroin, okay, they can go through all these tests, all these TSA, all the, all the x-ray machines, that just does your body, that doesn't do inside, okay, so my, my point is here, We've had them, like I said, four ounces of heroin. If it's four ounces of heroin that they can get by all this high tech stuff, they can, they, can, they can get by with four ounces of plastic explosive. Okay? So they get on a plane with four, four ounces of plastic explosive rectally in Belgium. They're coming to America. Okay? Halfway over, they go to the men's room. They get it out, okay? They, they affix it to the skin of the plane, okay, with their cell phone and everything, and they can bring down the plane. And they, they you know, you know and, uh, so, so this is huge, huge, huge problems that we're addressing every day. You know, con containers, especially reefers, are a huge problem. Uh, uh, the, the cruise ships, or I didn't even start talking about the cruise ships, big problem. Uh, the LNG, big problem. These packers, big problem. So. Like, what made you get into this kind of work? It's funny. It's, uh, uh, I, I, was, uh, I was working on tugboats, and uh, I was gone all the time. And I said, you know, you know, I, I, uh, uh, you know, maybe I should come ashore and start trying to live a normal life. So I went to customs, applied, and I knew they wouldn't hire me. I had a day off, so I just applied to customs, and lo and behold, they hired me right then and there. I said, geez, wow, they, they recognize talent, you know? And unbeknownst to me, like I said, I, I'm a vet, Vietnam veteran, and they had a thing called the VRA, the Veterans Readjustment Act. They had to fill their quota, and I was one, I filled their quota, you know? So, so I was hired as an entry-level position, and I just worked my way up to, uh, when I retired, I was a supervisor of the drug team and supervisor of the counterterrorism team. But, uh, yeah. Well, thanks so much for your okay. Thanks for coming.